Oh, Disney, the wonderful movies you make. <laughs> and the not-so-wonderful movies you make, but that's another day. <laughs> Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. My brain is meant, greetings, I'm Lux. Okay. <laughs> <sighs> and this is our thoughts on Saving Mr. Banks. I'm sorry, when you did that, I just totally went, Everybody, listen, Lux thinks he's a real unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the whole Buzz Lightyear Woody thing. <laughs> okay, it's been forever since I've seen any Toy Story movie. <laughs> then I don't know if you're qualified to do this recording. Uh-huh. <laughs> We're doing Saving Mr. Banks, not Toy Story. <laughs> Uh, why don't we start off with your thoughts? It was a very good movie, but anyone who was thinking that this is the making of Mary Poppins or that this was kid-friendly would be extremely disappointed because this is not about Mary Poppins. This is about Mr. Banks. It's right there in the title, and they weren't kidding. Mm -hmm. It's about the actual Mr. Banks or the person that Mr. Banks was very much based on, apparently. I definitely enjoyed this movie it was wow it, it was a really nice mm, I wouldn't say heartwarming but definitely memorable and emotional piece <laughs> yes a lot of pathos and as creators I feel we both had a lot of sympathy for Mrs. Travers because you know her creation was so precious to her and we've seen what happens when movie studios get a hold of books and make movies mm-hmm Oh, we don't need this plot point. We don't need this plot point. Oh, this character's not important. Or that's not important. But but all of that's actually important. You're just leaving it with this stuff. And why? And why is that character falling in love with that character? They weren't even hot? Yes, apparently movie writers are shippers. Mm -hmm. Or it's apparently we need to target the male demographic, but this book was written for everyone. But we need to target the male demographic to sell tickets. <laughs> So of course the male protagonist has to fall in with has to fall in love with someone. What? They need a romantic interest. You know, we also need to make it a date movie so these male people can bring their girlfriends, who aren't valuable at all. <laughs> okay, that's moving on from that. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing at the beginning that kind of confused me is, if you go to this movie not realizing it's a story about the lady who wrote Mary Poppins, you'll be confused in the beginning of the movie because. They don't really introduce who these characters are. They introduce their personalities, but you have no idea who they are. And how they relate to what you saw in the movie trailers. And that's where I go back to what I said in the beginning, that if you were expecting certain things, you will be disappointed because this movie is not those things. Mm -hmm. I'm also saying from the point of view of someone who goes in completely blind, just going, oh, I've heard good things about this movie and knows nothing about it. They're going to be confused for like the first 30 minutes. Okay, who are these people? Why should I care about them? What's the story? What? Because they don't explain any of that until they get to modern times and you realize like, oh, that's why these are important. <laughs> Which is a valid storytelling method, but I didn't feel as blind going in because I had read some reviews of the film prior to seeing it. Well, I had a feeling it wasn't going to be the making of Mary Poppins. It just looked like a really interesting movie and also Tom Hanks. So <laughs> he's just such a good actor that, you know, most movies he's in, almost all of them are usually good in some way or another. <laughs> Another weird oddity I saw in this movie is there was this one point where I think they did too much makeup on Tom Hanks. His face looked kind of stretched, like they taped back his face to get rid of some wrinkles. And like they overused tanning spray or something because there was like outlines around his eyes or something where his skin was a different tone than the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So that looked like it was an off day for the makeup team. Mm -hmm. But all other times he looked really good. He played the part of Disney really well. Especially he played Disney, not the Disney everyone saw, but he played the person Disney. Yes, yeah, someone who was demanding and who lost their temper and was used to being in control and getting what they wanted. 
not the fairy tale Disney of, you know, this is the man who is the benefactor of all young children for bringing all their dreams to life. So any more points you want to bring up along in the movie? Oh, that it was fascinating that there were actually recordings of Mrs. Trevor's session with the Disney staff, which gave us so much basis for this movie and for this movie to have so much credit in terms of reality because it very easily could have been the story of how the wonderful Walt Disney had to struggle against this shrewish woman to make the movie that we all love. But they were able to use those recordings to really build, I wouldn't say a completely factual, because you can't do that with a movie, but an accurate portrayal of the feelings and themes that were going on during those recording sessions. And there were two, for me, moments where Disney should say Walt Disney because we have Disney the studio and Disney the person when Walt Disney really portrayed that he understood both sides and one was the moment when he was talking to one of his staff about you know how he'd been in Mrs. Travers shoes had someone who wanted Mickey and was much more powerful and came after him and the other one was when he flew out to Mrs. Travers home and they had that discussion over tea, that whole thing about storytellers recreating reality, rewriting history the way they want it to happen. And that kind of hits home for creators like me and you and stuff like that, as you said before. And I was also reminded of at least the parts I know of the story behind Walt Disney and Oswald. I think that's the name of the character that he kind of lost control of. Yes, Oswald the Rabbit, which they regained control of several years ago. I believe they traded a football star or something to get him back. And <laughs> that's where we got the first Epic Mickey game. Because you had the limelight character Mickey and the forgotten left behind character Oswald. I still need to play through those games. I only have number two right now. I need to pick up number one sometime. Or borrow my copy. That too. And I think as creators, we probably also have a different appreciation of this movie because we go through stuff like this all the time with our own stories, even without a staff going, ah, what about this idea? Yes, and running it through a refining process. But I think one of the things this movie illustrates well for creators is that fear the fear of what happens to your beloved story when you hand it over to someone else. You know, in comparison, an author is somewhat safe. Once they get past the editors and actually get it published, it doesn't really change. They still wrote it. But with the movie rights or playwrights or any other type of recreation of your story, Someone else is doing the writing. Someone else is recreating your character. And it may, in the end, look nothing like your universe. And that's a scary thought. And I think they portrayed that fear very well. Because Mrs. Travers didn't want to do this at all. But she also had another real-world fear of financial issues. And had to struggle to try to get more finances while at the same time not compromising the heart of her stories. Though I really like how, I don't know how accurate this is, but I really like how it looks like having to go through this process and going back and conquering her old fears and memories of what happened to her father helped her break through and be able to write more about the character. Because it sounds like before this movie was made, she didn't really make any more books. Yeah, there was a gap in the publishing time in the Mary Poppins series and after the movie at least one more book was written. I've only read one of the books ever and it was when I was a child so I don't remember it very clearly. Yeah I've never read any of them myself. I only have experience through the movie. Oh and that reminds me uh, they did a great use of the Mary Poppins movie soundtrack during this movie. There were several times where they used different songs in the background to emphasize certain feelings and stuff like that and how they used it to connect to her past and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They wove it together very skillfully, taking music that we already knew and allowing it to help us interpret what we were looking at at that moment. 
And I just remember the great moment of, so how do they train penguins to dance? I know. And I just kept wincing when that one gentleman spoke. It's like, I know this was probably very much how it went, but my answer wouldn't have been, they're animated. My answer would have been, they'll be added in post via special effects. <laughs> Uh, well, you're much better at uh, coaxing or talking to other people than I am, and a lot of other people I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, you wouldn't have much trouble talking to her that often. <laughs> One thing that surprises me comparing what we learn in this movie to the final Mary Poppins film, other than the fact that we got Dick Van Dyke, is if Mrs. Travers was so against animation, how did we get that much animation in the movie? Because nearly the entire chalk drawing scene has animation of some sort. All the characters that did not jump into the chalk drawing are animated. We have that fox hunt, for no reason that I can tell, that's all animated. We have the horse race that is animated. We have the penguins that are animated. We have that very long sequence not animated, but suggestive of Mary Poppins and Bert's accessories acting like they're on a date. So, you know, we couldn't have any hint of impropriety between Mary Poppins and Bert, but hey, no rules about their accessories, so. Mm -hmm. I'm also trying to figure out how Mary Poppins herself got written so fancifully when the author seems to be so against the stuff that comes along with fantasy like that. She seemed to be like against almost everything whimsical and Mary Poppins, even though she's very stern, is very whimsical. <laughs> yes, and this is where it would be interesting to have read more of the books because Mary Poppins is very magical, but she is also very stern. I also love how in the flashbacks they kind of showed you little things that kind of uh, mirrored what happened in the Mary Poppins movie. Like when the maid that Mary Poppins seems to be based on arrives, she starts pulling things out of her, I think it's called a carpet bag. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's her aunt. That's her aunt? Yes. Didn't you catch that the name was the same? Hmm. And all of Travers, not Mrs. Travers, but Helen's father, referencing that name and how she's an evil witch and insisting that his wife not call for her sister. Hmm. But of course, after his collapse, he doesn't really have that kind of authority anymore. Hmm. I didn't catch that at all. You're very good at picking up on details like that. <laughs> I try. I just liked all the little touches like that in the movie. So do you have more thoughts? Mm, the way they paralleled things, you know, that her father had said or that she had observed as a child being said or brought up by the Americans that she was dealing with. Like when Ralph says a leisurely walk is a gift. Oh, yeah. You know, that was something that her father said. That reminds me, I really like the relationship between her and the cab driver. Well, not cab driver, but limo driver or chauffeur. I really like the, the relationship between those two. Yeah, I think they were the ones who got along the best out of anyone and i hope a lot of that is true because they were really there for each other she provided encouragement regarding his daughter and then when she came back to the premiere and was so nervous he was providing encouragement to her because like many really creative people she appears to be socially awkward we did see her having a lot of medications, so we don't know if that was physical or mental. They were on the nightstand one time. Hmm. Oh, and that also reminds me of the Mickey Mouse plushie. Yes. One, that was a great job on replicas. And wow, if the room was that overstuffed with them, I probably would have thrown them all in the closet too. <laughs> uh... Yeah, when I first saw that scene, I was like, wow, they did a great job of tracking those down. Then I saw her tossing stuff in the closet. I'm like, nope, those are replicas. Because <laughs> if those were actual collectibles, they, they said it would like, be very gentle with these. Mm -hmm. And then I also liked the symbolism of how the Mickey plush was used. At one point, she actually brought it into the bed with her, which is symbolic of starting the relationship with the studio. 
and then actually having the plush sitting across from her while she's signing the contract. Mm -hmm. And she talks to it on multiple occasions as well. At least I remember one time she was talking to it, probably during the scene where she was signing. Mm -hmm. Going back to the songs real quick, I also like how the songs are eventually what bring her into more liking the movie. Well, it wasn't so much the song. It was that they changed the ending. So the fact that Mr. Banks fixed the kite and now the family was being drawn together by this moment. Though, I still want to know how we got supercalifragilisticexpialidocious past this woman. <laughs> That also reminds me of the little nugget of information about Mr. Banks is actually supposed to more resemble Disney's father. Mm -hmm. uh, well, overall, I really like this movie. Just a couple of technical things, really, that, you know, kind of bugged me. But there wasn't really much other than that. And by the end of the movie, I was like, wow, that was a really good movie. I really enjoyed myself watching it. Yeah, I very much enjoyed it. It is not for everyone. It is definitely not for children and it is not for anyone who likes their disney stories whitewashed and fairy tale this has true moments of darkness but that's part of what makes it so engaging you know the difficulties the everyday struggles that people encounter okay i admit it's not every day you go to disneyland with walt disney but <laughs> yeah that reminds me of that one of my favorite parts uh so I can't believe you invited, I can't believe you, something about took me all the way down here and got me under this rider for something. And he's like, no, I did it to win a bet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because that's just so something Disney would have done. Mm -hmm. And this has been our thoughts on Saving Mr. Banks. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing and or leaving a friendly comment below. Want to know more of what's going on? You can check Lux out on Tumblr and DeviantArt. Really like Lux's art and would like some high quality versions or maybe some of your own? He is currently accepting commissions and also has a Patreon. All links in the description.